Good morning. Morning. So great to see all of your beautiful faces this morning, and and uh, just that we get to come here and worship together in this place. All glory to God. Yeah. Uh, let's go through a few announcements again. There's quite a few in the bulletin, so please take note of those with which I don't men- or didn't mention. Uh, one is just a reminder that about 10 minutes after the service today, those who are willing and desire to do so, I'm asking that you reconvene in here and we're going to have just some time where we can pray specifically for our nation um, as we have uh, the voting obviously that's coming up. And so I will just say make sure that you um, continue to pray and then go about voting if you have not done so. Uh, this coming week. So that again will be 10 minutes if you need to get up and use the restroom or if you need to to get up and go if you have other things on your agenda today, feel free to do that. Uh, Secondly, just want to bring back to your attention uh, from last week, we had a few glitches with getting Right Now Media's email sent out, but it should be out now. Um, If you don't see an email from me, you got two options. One is to you know, call me or email me and, and follow up. The other thing I discovered this week was that at least one person did have it go to their junk email. So if you don't see it or haven't seen it, look there first um, to see if it may be in there and get registered. I did put, these are different in appearance, but I wanted to fix my typo from last week. There are a bunch of these papers that we handed out last night at Trump Retreat, and there are a bunch of them on the back table when you walked in. Um, by communion. These are easy instructions for anyone to get onto Right Now Media. And as I want to emphasize one more time this week, um, probably won't be the last time I say this, but anyone that you would like to have know that, you know, if it's a grandchild or grandkids or kids or friends or someone in your neighborhood that you think would benefit from this, you know, I think about all that is on TV and I, I hear about all the laments about what is on TV these days. Here are, especially for kids, great programming with which they can get engaged with and hear about the gospel as well. So take as many of these as you need. Ultimately, what you need to tell them, your only responsibility is to say, it's, you know, you've got access to a bunch of the uh, Bible studies, kids programming, and then direct them to my email address. Once they email me, I'll take over and make sure that they get set up and everything. Okay. Also back there... You maybe saw this for the first time. I want to make a point of this so that it's clear. Uh, I got through putting together business cards for the church. And so there are about 50 of them on that back table as well that are magnetized. So I think a lot of people might like to have stuck right up on their magnet. It's got church information. It's got the website, um, Facebook, all the ways to connect. It's got the church phone number as well. If you grab one that, or some of them, take a bunch. Again, if you know people, that would be, it'd be helpful. But... If you give the magnetized ones, just so you know, you can also tell them that there is a free gift on the back because what's on the back is one avenue with which they can have access to the gospel. Maybe you've heard of the Romans Road approach. There's different uh, ways, but so there is. I didn't take one up here without it, but you can look at some back there that also don't have magnets. So I encourage you to to take a few. I know Layton was busy handing out a bunch of these to people that came in to trunk or treat last night. So it's just another way to kind of promote the church to people that are in our in our midst. And we can always print more. I've got a whole, that pile is not all of them. I've got a bunch more in my office that I have to magnetize still. So take as many as you feel that you need. Uh, men's breakfast is this Saturday at 8 o'clock. So don't forget about that as well. Am I getting some extra feedback here, it sounds like? Let me see if I can adjust it. any better. Okay. Um, and then <laughs> I'll just do this. Um, and then so men's breakfast at 8 o'clock on Saturday here at the church. We will be taking, and I will say I've been bad at mentioning this, I think I've mentioned this each month, but each communion Sunday we do have a benevolent offering and the plate is back by the communion table. So if you um, would like to give to that need, that basket is in the back separately. Uh, and then one last thing, this is on a personal note from Emily and the kids and I. We want to just thank you so much for all of the uh, expressions of gratitude, whether it be just in a thanks, you know, just giving us thanks or the cards 
Um, the gifts, way more than what we deserve, um, but it is just a reminder of the blessings that we have to be here. And we are so thankful for each one of you, uh, the opportunity we get to pray for you and, and, and walk alongside you. Sounds good now, right? Uh, so I'll just keep going and take note of anything else that's in the bulletin. Like I said, we've got our normal groups that are, are meeting um, at this point, and so just continue to find ways to plug in, ways to use your gifts. Uh, one thing, I will just say trunk or treat. I guess I didn't say anything about that. I'll just share, we had about 100, and, I'd say between anywhere between 120 and 150 kids by the time it was all said and done. Parents were dressed up as well, some of them. Uh, young, older kids than what I might normally expect, but I think it was a sign that they're they're getting anxious about being indoors and all everything's going on. And that we look at that as not only that 120 to 150 kids came through here, but also that this is the beginnings, hopefully, of a way to connect in community. And it's I, I want to thank those of you also too. Is whatever role you played in helping out, whether it was here handing out candy or decorating your car or encouraging and inviting. I mean, how many times I saw the, the picture shared on Facebook and handed out in the community. It doesn't happen unintentionally. We have to use our gifts. And, and so the encouragement I kept getting from several of you afterwards is we need to do more of this kind of stuff. So I'm going to just say we need to do more of this kind of stuff, but it takes the whole village. I want to see God move, and one of the great ways is to start by continuing to, to make connections within our community and, and those in Litchfield and Wilmer and, and all around us. So I continue to encourage you, think about where your gifts are, if you need some help in finding what, discovering what those gifts are, or how to implement them. I'd much rather you say, hey, how can this be used? This is what I desire to see done. Let's talk about it. Let's make it happen. That's what we're here for, to be the body of Christ. All right, time to turn to our prayers this morning. Prayers, what prayers do we have for um, the needs within our community here at First Baptist or within just the, your own individual communities that you foster through your jobs or just in your homes, whatever that may be. We have a, we have a good friend named Laura. <coughs> she just had surgery last week for breast cancer, and um, December 7th, she has to have a hysterectomy because they found cancer there as well. Okay. And I just want to give a praise for Chunk or Treat, too. It was windy, it was cold, um, but for three hours or two hours, whatever, there was no COVID, there was no political hate. Just kids having a good time. By the way, he's not here. I'll bring up Dan. Dan Foster Bowles said he was very happy to be here. He just wants us to do it on July 4th next year, <laughs> <laughs> so that he can complain about it being too hot. <laughs> we can be flexible here. <laughs> Thank you, Paula, for both of those. Other prayers this morning. Um, can never pray enough for the things in our in going on in our world. So
Okay, well, let's go to God in prayer. And again, as always, I'll open it up for anyone who wants to pray, and I will close. And Lord, we lift up Laura and uh, the uh, upcoming uh, battle she has with cancer and for the hysterectomy that is, that is uh, to be done here shortly. Lord, we think about all of the illness in our country, in our, in our own lives, and the lives of those around us. We think about the division in our country. Uh, and Lord, and yet to echo Luke's prayer this morning, God is big. God, we know that you are sovereign over all, and, uh, and that regardless of, of uh, what happens individually or with, with the election, Lord, that we are reminded, as Ed said, that you are, you're in control. You know the end from the beginning. You know uh, what will take place in this country, and you've known it since the beginning, of, since before the beginning of time. Father, we don't have that information in front of us, but what we do have is the opportunity to be faithful to you, to be faithful to your commissioning of the church, that it is through us that we are to help lead people to your name, to glorify you, to give honor to you, to praise, to praise you regardless of our circumstances. Father, we've already addressed in previous messages about the, the, the fear of the future and the fear of the unknown and how it can be very unsettling. And yet, Lord, we stand here before you desiring that you be in control. Lord, desiring that you take that fear from us, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you in word and deed. In your name we pray. Amen.
This time we're going to have a time of confession, but it's going to be a little bit different than before. I'm going to ask you shortly to read something that will be up on the screen um, as we go. I'll, I'll say that again here shortly. But as we sang just a few moments ago, we are prone to wander. We are prone to leave the God that we love. Because this is true, because we are sinful, and because God is holy, we must continually and regularly repent. You know, I sat in a group with a couple of gentlemen this morning, and I, we were talking about repentance. And I said, you know, I find myself often saying, we need to repent daily. And yet, I find for myself, that often is not frequently enough. That it, repentance is to become an attitude of the heart. That when something happens in our lives, which does not glorify and honor God, that we must repent. We must not wait. Because if we live with unrepentant sin in our hearts, it continues to seep into our lives and becomes more insidious and more prevalent. So at this time, if you would, if you're able and willing to stand, we're gonna, I'm gonna have Ron put part of it on the screen. We're gonna read this together. We're going to pause to, to kind of silently prayer, and then we will finish this confession. <laughs> See how good, of a, how good we can be as a body here. Ready? Okay. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have disobeyed your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought not to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no help in us. We confess, O oh God, that these are great evils. Have mercy on us, O oh Lord, for we are miserable offenders. Meet us here as we prepare to take communion and cleanse us from our sin. We know that if we in the church disregard sin in our own midst, our prayers will be ineffectual. So we confess our individual sins to you now. Father, we thank you for the mercy you give us in Christ. Assure us of that mercy, now so that we might boldly approach your throne with boldness. Cleanse our consciences that your word might take root in our hearts. Receive us in Jesus' name that we might eat and drink with him. And then send us from this place, free to love and sacrifice and announce the good news of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Today we gather together to partake in the Lord's Supper. In Christ, we can come before God with a contrite heart. We remember that in the past, we were without we were without Christ. We had no hope and did not know God. But now, through faith in Christ Jesus, we have been brought near to God. You were bought with the precious blood of death of Christ, who was like a pure and perfect lamb. God was pleased for all of himself to live in Christ. God made peace by using his blood by using the blood of Christ's death on the cross. He brings you before God as people who are now holy. You have been born again. This new life did not come from something that dies, but from something that cannot die. God is light. He is in the light. 
we must live in that light too. If we live in the light, we share fellowship with each other. And when we live in the light, the blood of the death of Jesus is making us clean from every sin. Jesus is the only way our sins are taken away. And so we gather together this morning in remembrance of all that Jesus has done for each one of us here. And we do so by remembering it through communion. At this time, I'm going to ask Ron if he would pray for the bread. Lord, Christ's body was hanging on the cross for us. Forgive our sins. Take our sins to remove them. Because we take this bread, a symbol of his body, Lord. We're putting that inside to give us life. The life, the bread of life, comes to us through Christ. Let us all confess and remember the Christ and the God that is above us. In his name we pray. Amen. On the night Jesus was handed over to be killed, he took the bread and gave thanks for it. Then he broke the bread and said, This is my body. It is for you. Do this to remember me. Take and eat. In the same way, after they ate, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup shows the new agreement from God to his people. It begins with the blood of my death. When you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Drink ye all. on to say in that, that every time that we gather to eat the bread and drink the cup, that we do this in remembrance of God until he comes again. Glory be for that day. All right, our, uh, I'd like to actually start this morning with a, uh, with a story here first, before we get to our text. This is a true story that was told to me about 20 years or so ago from an uncle of mine. He and his wife, my aunt, were had decided to take a uh, whitewater rafting trip, and it was uh, it was very primitive. I've never had the blessing or the curse, depending on which way you want to look at it, of, of going and doing something quite like that. But as you can imagine, uh, one of the downfalls of that is there were no uh, locations with which people could alleviate their need to go to the bathroom, and so. On this trip, there were a bunch of couples, and one other uh, combination was the grandfather and his grandson. And so the story begins that one morning as they were on the trip, uh, the grandfather gets up and he goes to use the bathroom down by the, by the river. So he goes down to the river, and his grandson had made his way down the river, you know, 50 yards or so, and was just kind of looking out. And, the grandfather, is, as he starts to go to the bathroom, he looks out at the river and realizes what a glorious day this will be for whitewater rafting. 
the river was rushing, and it was a beautiful morning. And then, all of a sudden, he lost his footing and fell into the river. Immediately swept down. Now the, the, the grandson, who was down the river, again about 50 yards, happened to see what was going on. And he quickly raced back to camp, about another 50 yards. He raced as fast as he could and grabbed a lifeline. As he's running back, my uncle and all of those who were also at the camp realized what was going on. But by this point, as they were watching the grandson race back to the river's edge, they realized there was nothing that they could do. By the time the grandson reached the shore, even at the ripe young age of 18, he was able to deduce that he had one shot, one chance to save his grandfather's life before his grandfather was swept away. And so he wound up having never done this before. And by the grace of God, he threw the lifeline, the buoy, out into the river directly in the path of his grandfather. And the grandfather was able to grab onto it and was pulled to safety. I had the blessing to be able to meet this young man through my uncle about a year later. What a story. What a story of someone who had the courage and God's providence that worked through this, and he did not miss that. He understood that it was, it was God in the midst of everything that had happened. I never got a chance to meet the grandfather, but um, I, can, I, I can't even begin to imagine the sense of gratitude uh, apart from the only thing I can equate it to is my connection with Christ. This level of that I, you know, what do I deserve in this? That nothing I can do can save me. So this morning we're going to do something a little different. So those of you that really like to dig into the word and read it as I'm going to, or share it as I'm going to, I'm going to ask you not to. I do not want you to read the text this morning. You can read it later. Um, but I'm going to share it with you, in part because we sometimes need to be reminded how the original listeners heard it, but also in part because I'm setting off on my own personal journey that some of you know about and others don't. And it is a journey of, uh, of desiring to make the word even more deeply planted in me through memorization. And so... Uh, I'm going to be sharing this. Hopefully, we'll see how it goes. So please uh, do everything in your power not to follow along now to, to, to call me out on my mistakes. But um, we're going to read from Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is growing and bearing fruit throughout the, throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason... Ever since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to give you the knowledge of his will, according through all wisdom and, and understanding that the Spirit gives. 
in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power through his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people, the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. My sermon in a sentence this week is this, that prayer is the most powerful communication device that we have at our disposal. It is our lifeline to an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent God, a God who is all-loving, is everywhere, and all-knowing. The concept of prayer is not unique to Christians. People of various faiths throughout history have offered up prayers. In fact, a higher percentage than you might think of agnostics who uh, deny that God's existence is knowable and atheists who don't believe in a God still offer up prayers. I want you to consider this question for a second. It is a rhetorical question. But it's if one man prays for rain, in the same exact location that another man prays that it won't rain, whose prayer does God answer? What underlies a question such as this? Now, this question may seem silly, and ultimately we all hope, well, maybe not all of us, but we hope that Ralph's prayer is the one that's answered, right? For your, <laughs> if you're Ralph, at least, Ralph and Connors, but... Um, while it seems like it's silly, the reality is that this kind of thinking is not that uncommon for us to live under this mindset. There's been much confusion throughout history about who to pray to, how to pray, why we pray, how often should we pray, or even what posture should we pray in? in order that God may answer us favorably? And so we're going to answer those questions as we proceed through this series, not all today, so you don't want to miss any of them because these answers are coming. But today we're going to turn our focus on the source of our prayer and what we pray. So first, our prayers are answered by the one true God, according to his will, not ours. The absolute most important thing we can ask ourselves with regard to prayer is this. To whom is it that we pray? Many people throughout the course of history have, taught, have sought to use their human strength or manipulate some method in attempt to appease their gods to get what they want. Other people have chosen to lift up their prayers through dead Christians. And that is their source, as though that is what they need to inter as an intermediary to reach God. Scripture, on the other hand, reveals that we are to pray through the Godhead, through Father, through Son, and through Spirit. Because it is the one true God alone who has the power to answer our prayers. Consider this story of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18. And that's referenced on there. Again, I don't have this one on the screen because I'm not going to read the whole story. I'm going to kind of tell you the, the gist of the story. But this is a great story to follow through with later on. In the text that, we, that I'm referencing... God uses Elijah to reveal to the prophets of Baal that their prayers are wasted because they are praying to false gods. Elijah issues a challenge. The prophets of Baal and Elijah would each prepare a sacrifice. 
but they would not light it. They would cry out to their gods to light it. 450 prophets of Baal, who can stir up quite a noise, cry out to their god. During the course of the entire time that they cry out, even harming themselves in an effort to appease Baal, they receive no response. One of my favorite pieces of Old Testament scripture follows that, and it says, Elijah, this is what the text says, Elijah proceeds to mock them. He says, call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied or gone, or is on a journey, or is perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. Then Elijah, to add insult to injury, takes four pitchers of water and pours it on his sacrifice. And he cries out to God, his small one voice. And his prayers are answered with an all-consuming fire. Who we pray to reveals who we are following. Elijah's story reminds us that the true power comes from the one true God. In the letter that I just read to you from Colossians, Paul addresses his letter very specifically to the one true God. He says, this is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, rather than the hundreds of gods that Colossians had previously tried to worship. When we seek adequate answer to our prayer, when we pray to the wrong place, we will receive no response. But it is when we pray to the true God where power is found. Now, I almost took this story out because I don't know how many of you are familiar with the game of cricket. No? Okay, I'll, I'll, have, to, I'll, I'll have to try to explain it very quickly. But basically, the way it is, it's similar to baseball. There's, a, there's two wickets, which are basically wooden stands, and, and the middle piece on the wicket, if it gets hit with a ball, will fall down, and that constitutes as an out. And so you have two batters, one on each end with a big stick, not a bat, it looks a little different. But So a pitcher on one end throws the ball, and the batsman has to try to hit the ball. Now, if the ball goes past the batsman and hits the peg down, that's one out. It's like baseball, you get three outs. If they hit the ball, then they can score runs. Now, in order to score a run, both batsmen, and I don't remember the exact distance, it's quite a distance, they both have to communicate to run to each other's base. If they both successfully make it to the other person's base before the ball gets returned, that's a run. They can keep running back and forth. You know, if the guy hits it out into, into the, uh, into, if I hit it from my yard into Brett, Brett and Paul's yard, I could probably run back and forth with Emily two or three times. But if, the, if in the process of running, the, uh, the defensive team throws the ball and knocks the peg down, that's an out. So with that in mind, the team, you can envision that once the ball's hit, the players have to be communicating back and forth, is that, is that far enough away? Can we make it? And so with that in mind, I want you to hear some of the language that they use, and then it'll sink in why I'm using this as an example. So when they hit the ball, one will shout to the other, yes, that is, let's run, or no, that is, stay where you are, or wait, that is, let's see what happens before we decide whether to run. So whether they might fumble the ball or kick the ball or whatever, or what kind of arm they have. God hears all your prayers. And in one sense, he answers all of them. But we do not always receive what we ask. When we ask God for something, the response will be yes, or no, or wait. When we trust in the Lord, and the closer our will is to fully being conformed to Him, the easier it is to understand God's prayers. When He says yes, we all rejoice, because our wills are aligned with what God is answering. 
When, we, when he says no, it can be often very, it can be a stumbling block for us. And yet the more we are aligned with who God is, the more willing we are to understand that no means this is not for your best interest. Do you believe that? Because I know that if I ask any of you to share, you would all say you've heard no before. Do you believe that God's best, that God has your best interest in mind? Or when he says wait, are you willing to wait with him and pray with him and continue to ask for his timing? Secondly, through prayer we thank God for the fruit he bears in the lives of believers. So why were Paul and Timothy thanking God for the Colossians? He says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Why? Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven. They are praying for the fruit that was born into the lives of these believers whom they loved. And that it, the faith and love that come naturally from their newfound hope of eternity with Christ. The faith that they declared through Jesus, the Son of the one true God, who was fully man and fully God. And it was through him that they were able to receive redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We can learn a lot about these words, about what to pray from Paul's words. It is only by grace and power of God that we can be transformed from people who live by the flesh into people who live by the Spirit. When our faith is grown, we experience the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We rejoice in seeing this type of fruitful change in our own lives and in the lives of those around us. Because we know that only God can do that. Because when I am in the flesh, when I want to love people or, or be peaceful to people or say kind things, it still doesn't happen easily. It is only by the work and grace of God with which these fruits can be born in our lives. We pray consistently and constantly that, a, that God will build up an even greater faith and love that can only come from the hope that we have stored up in Jesus. That treasure. That allows us a mindset shift. Now, let's pause for just a second and focus on God's work in that in our own lives. Because we can be very difficult on ourselves. Frankly, sometimes we need to be difficult on ourselves, but there are times where we can be too hard. It's easy to live in guilt, not truly living into God's promise that our sins have been removed. There's no sense in us spending our time confessing before God if we don't believe that he can forgive them and wash them as far from the east as from the west. Yet we don't take time to thank God for his provision in transforming us. So I want to again ask you just take a moment silently and lift up a prayer of thankfulness for the fruit that God has worked in your life. Now lift up one person from within the body of the church here that you have also seen and pray specifically for the fruits you have seen born in their own in their lives. What a blessing it is that God is a God of transformation, of fresh starts, of being renewed and transformed. Prayer is the best communication tool we have. Yet notice Paul doesn't leave it there. In all of his letters, he talks openly and emphatically 
about the genuine love he has for his brothers and sisters in Christ, telling them just how thankful he is that God is growing his people. Some of the people with which, by the way, Paul had never himself met. But, he's, but God has given him such a genuine love for his people. Oh, how I long for that kind of love in my own life. Let our conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that we may encourage one another and in this, in this body intentionally and often. Do not let my point here pass you by. We must know one another. We must be honest with who we are and where God has brought us. And to love and encourage one another because of what Christ has done for us. This is not a one-time event. We can't just encourage, I can't just come up and encourage Betsy for her help last night and just say, well, I filled her encouragement day. She's good for the rest of her life. Don't need to bother about that relationship anymore. That would be nice if it worked that way, but not that I don't, I don't, I do love you, but you know what I mean. So, <laughs> we know that humans need repetitive practice in order to do this kind of thing that I'm talking about. So here's the thing. I'm going to hold your feet to the fire a little bit after the service today, and you can do it from six feet away if you need to. But I'm going to ask you intentionally to go to at least one person that's in this room, maybe even the person you just prayed for if they're here, and encourage them specifically for the fruits that you just prayed for them, that you have seen born in their lives. We are connected to one another by shared experiences. We have the shared life experiences we have faced. And by the God who unites us in what he has done for us. And finally, prayer and reading the word are where we receive the knowledge of God's will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. We live in a day where we have access to all sorts of knowledge. We can go to our electronic device that many of you have in your pocket. And we can do a little typing probably faster than I can on my phone, and we can find all sorts of things. And yet, wisdom and discernment are much harder to find. In fact, from what I can tell, they appear to be in great shortage. We are reminded again through the, that it is the fear of God that is the beginning of wisdom, not any mental capacity that we have. Yet Paul says we can have the knowledge of God's will through wisdom and understanding that who gives? The Spirit. And look at what the purpose for knowing God's will is. Living a life. This was all from Colossians. It should be up there. I think. Living a worthy life. Gaining valuable knowledge. Receiving power that allows us to endure this life and to have patience in its challenges and to live with joy. What was the difference between Peter and the other disciples before Christ's crucifixion and after the Pentecost? I'm going to focus mainly on Peter here, although they all were good examples of this. But remember, right before Christ died, what Peter did three times. Denied him. And after that, they went and they went up to the upper room and kind of hid out, waited, unsure of what was next. And yet, shortly after, when Christ returns, we see him boldly proclaiming, even to the point where he repeatedly, when, when told to stop or else, he says, I will not stop. So what was the difference? Do you remember that scene where they're sitting in the upper room and they're waiting? Because interestingly enough, and I missed this many times when I read through Acts, and another pastor in previous years pointed it out to me, is we would expect that when Jesus returned that he would say, go, go do the mission, go, go out and do the work. But what he actually says to them first is, wait. Wait here for until, or until the day that my gift comes. And that gift is the Spirit. It is the Spirit in Peter. That, that changes not only him, not only the other apostles, but also us. 
Just like the apostles. If you want to, like, if you woke up this morning, I want to have boldness. I pray for boldness from God. That I will be bold in sharing my faith. I want you to know that that boldness does not come from yourself. It comes from the Spirit. You cannot have this boldness that God talks about without the Spirit. And you can't have the Spirit in full unless you're praying for the Spirit. Prayer brings us the Spirit, and the Spirit is the boldness. Not only that the Spirit gives us the boldness, the Spirit is the boldness. I run into people all the time, and and they say, "I, I need more boldness. I say, do you have the Spirit in you? Is the Spirit in you? Because it is the same Spirit that resides in you, that resides in Peter. And all of the apostles, you have everything you need within you. What you need to provide is the will, which I talked about last week. So prayer and boldness and the Spirit are inextricably linked. If you feel short on any of the fruits of the Spirit or on boldness, it's time to bend your knee and pray. Ask God to give you those things. The Spirit is placed in our lives for the express purpose of giving us power when we are otherwise powerless. But not the world, not the power that our world promises. That kind of power is temporary. It might feel good in the moment, but it's temporary. But we can pray with all power that through His glorious might, we might gain the power of God. Why do we want this? Why should we want this? So that we may persevere and focus all praise and honor on a God who has qualified you. Don't miss that last part. It's God who qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people. In the kingdom of life, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What an awesome God that we serve who's all-powerful and yet humble enough to offer us this gift of prayer that we can communicate with him. And so we remember that prayer is the most powerful communication tool we have. It is our lifeline to a God who is in complete control of this world. Let's pray.